I'm Dr. Fakir Robbery and this is Invasive Fungal Infections in Adults. Fungal infections have an enormous impact on human health. There has been a significant increase in the incidence of fungal infections worldwide, primarily due to advances in organ and bone marrow transplantation, cytotoxic chemotherapy, widespread use of indwelling IV catheter, and increased use of potent broad spectrum antibiotics. Fungi are eukaryotes, so they do have a nucleus inside the cell and they have many organelles known in eukaryotes including endoplasmic reticulum, mitochondria and Golgi apparatus. But one main difference between the fungi cell and other eukaryotes such as humans is that instead of cholesterol in the cell membrane, they have ergosterol, which is a target of some antifungal agents. Now, fungi also have rigid cell walls that are composed of chitin, cellulose, or both, and, that, and those uh, can actually be stained in addition to gram stain. So there are spe specialized uh, stains for fungal agents or organisms. Most, most fungi, except for candida species, are too weakly gram positive to be seen uh, on a gram stain. So that's why we need specialized uh, uh, dyes for staining. Now let's take a look at clinically important fungi. In general, fungi can be divided into yeasts, molds, and dimorphic. Candida and cryptococcus species are yeasts that commonly cause in, uh, fungal infections in susceptible hosts. Now yeasts are typically round or oval. They generally form smooth, flat colonies, and they reproduce by budding. Now, candida exist in three biological phases. So yeast in the yeast form, they can also exist in pseudo hyphae as well as hyphae. Now, when they are in the hyphae form, they can cause tissue damage by invading mucosal epithelial cells, and then they can lead to blood infections. Now, molds are also composed of tubular structures called uh, hyphae, but they grow by branching and longitudinal extension. And their colonies typically appear fuzzy. Now, conidium, or conidia is the plural form, is a, an asexual spore usually produced at the tip or side of a hypha, and that's important in uh, spreading this mold around. Now, the common molds that cause Fungal infections include Aspergillus, Fusarium, and Mucoralis. Mucoralis and Fusarium are less common, but they are much, much more resistant to antifungal agents, and the mortality rate in these infections are extremely high. And lastly, we have dimorphic fungi, and these can actually grow as both mold and yeast, so they basically exist uh, or behave like molds. So they, are, they look filamentous uh, and they uh, behave like mold at room temperature, uh, but at body temperature, they actually behave like yeasts. And that's why they are called dimorphic. Now these species include uh, coccidioides that can cause uh, coxy or valley fever. Uh, there's also blastomyces that cause uh, blastomycosis and histoplasma, which can cause uh, histoplasmosis. Uh, and these are essentially called endemic fungal infections, meaning that they are, uh, they, they are um, only in certain geographic regions. For example, in Central California is known for being endemic to coxy. Here are some reliable resources. So IDSA guidelines have several uh, guidelines for fungal infections. Uh, most common ones include uh, the 2016 uh, guidelines for management of candidiasis. So these are any infections called by uh, candida species. There are also 2016 guidelines for uh, diagnosis and management of aspergillosis. Uh, 
And there's also a joint guideline between uh, IDSA and um, ASCO for antimicrobial prophylaxis for adult patients with cancer-related immunosuppression that include antibiotics as well as antifungal prophylaxis. Uh, another guideline is the 2016 IDSA guideline for coccidioidomycosis. And there are a, uh, a few other older guidelines. So there's the 2010 guideline for cryptococcal uh, disease. Uh, now, cryptococcal disease, uh, because uh, they're also very common in patients with HIV, there are also uh, HIV guidelines for opportunistic infections that cover cryptococcal uh, disease, and those are updated more frequently. Uh, but IDSA guidelines are actually from 2010. And there are older guidelines, 2008 for blastomycosis and 2007 guidelines for histoplasmosis. The first learning objective is describe the pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic, and toxicodynamic properties of antifungal agents. Here's an overview of how uh, various antifungal agents work. So we have agents that actually go all the way into the nucleus of the fungal cell and prevent uh, DNA and RNA synthesis. Uh, we have agents that uh, work on the cell wall, uh, including agents that prevent the synthesis of ergost uh, ergosterol. Uh, that's essential for the cell membrane. There are agents that actually cause a pore inside the cell membrane and cause wasting of um, various electrolytes and uh, leading to cell death. And we have uh, agents that prevent uh, synthesis of uh, beta-glucan, which is also uh, uh, important in the cell membrane. And they are important in uh, the structure of the cell wall. So beta-glucans uh, beta are components of the cell wall. Now the first class of antifungal agents are azoles or more specifically triazoles and uh, they essentially inhibit synthesis of ergosterol by blocking uh, 14 alpha uh, demethylase which is essentially a CYP enzyme so this is CYP51 in the uh, fungal cell and uh, these agents act by inhibiting this enzyme. So one way that resistance can uh, occur um, in fungal species is uh, primarily through increased um, production of this enzyme, uh, which is uh, a product of uh, ERG11 gene. Uh, they can also cause alterations in the binding site on this CYP enzyme. And of course, uh, they can also be drug uh, efflux pumps that will uh, pump the azoles out of the fungal cell. So what normally happens is that uh, this uh, ERG11 uh, gene leads to uh, the formation of uh, C51 enzyme, which leads to synthesis of ergosterol, which is important for cell membrane. Uh, when, we, you, when you have azoles, they essentially block this process, so you, uh, the cell membrane will not have these uh, ergosterol, which results in uh, cell wall um, inhibition. Now let's take a look at each azole uh, one by one. So the first one is fluconazole. Fluconazole is available as PO and IV, uh, you know, for systemic infections, of course, also available in other formulations, uh, but for invasive fungal infections, uh, we're interested in IV and PO. Uh, we, they can be taken without regard to food. Uh, in general, fluconazole is extremely safe. Uh, you know, very little toxicity. Uh, patients may um, experience some headache, but in general, very well to tolerated. And, uh, you know, the hepatotoxicity essentially means that uh, this fluconazole can lead to transaminitis. So maybe ASC and ALT will be elevated, but in general, very well tolerated. Now, with long-term use, so if people are taking it for months, or perhaps uh, for indefinite duration of therapy, they can um, experience some uh, other adverse effects, including xerosis and alopecia. But for acute uh, use of fluconazole, these are extremely rare, or in fact, they may not occur. Now, one thing of note is that all azoles, in one way or another, they affect QTC. So it's important to have EKG on board if 
uh, they are to be used long term. Uh, uh, so if fluconazole does prolong QTC and also one must consider other agents that the patient might be taking that can lead to QTC prolongation. The next agent is itraconazole. So itraconazole uh, is not available as IV. Uh, there used to be an IV formulation that's been taken off the market for due to concerns for um, congestive heart failure. In fact, this black box warning is specifically from the IV formulation. Uh, but uh, with the oral formulation, there is a capsule and there is a solution. In general, with the older formulation, because there is a new formulation called Suba itraconazole, and Suba essentially uh, supra bioavailable, so they increase the bioavailability in this formulation. So this, so this one is relatively new and therefore more expensive. Uh, so the more affordable one is the older formulation, which had limited bioavailability. So between the capsule and solution, the solution must be on empty stomach, uh, but the capsule with food. And the solution actually has much, much better bioavailability. So most people actually use the solution and patients have to take it on empty stomach. Now, the new formulation is promising, but it's relatively new. So it's, uh, you know, kind of expensive right now. But in time, this will luckily overcome the limitations of uh, bioavailability because it's really difficult to have patients. If you are to dose this twice a day, it's difficult to have empty stomach twice a day. You know, especially in the evening, it becomes uh, very challenging for patients. Now, in relative to fluconazole, there are uh, you know more adverse effects with itraconazole. So hepatotoxicity is still there. So perhaps increased ASD, ALT, and uh, you know some GI uh, GI effects. But also itraconazole associated with hypertension, hypokalemia. Uh, so you know the potassium levels should be. Uh, monitored and some patients may need to be on potassium supplementation uh, to manage this hypokalemia and it can also lead to peripheral edema so those are important to uh, to monitor and of course uh, it's important to, if if the patient also has a heart failure it's you know it's not a contraindication but it's important to monitor the patient closely now the mechanism behind the uh, uh, pretty much all of these hypertension, hyperkalemia, and peripheral edema is that uh, essentially uh, itraconazole can lead to uh, mineral corticoid uh, excess. So as a result, uh, you know, there will be uh, hyp hypokalemia and uh, fluid retention. Now, it can also uh, lead to QTC prolongation. Uh, next, we have voriconazole. Voriconazole is the one with the most adverse effect, and it is available as PO and IV. The PO formulation uh, must be taken somewhat on empty stomach, essentially one hour before or after food, so it doesn't have to be completely empty stomach. And here are the adverse effects. So hepatotoxicity is much more significant with uh, voriconazole. Uh, it can also lead to neurotoxicity, specifically... Uh, reversible uh, ocular toxicity such as uh, photopsia, uh, photophobia, and color changes. It can also lead to rash and photosensitivity and with long-term use this uh, similar to uh, fluconazole can lead to xerosis and alopecia and it also causes significant prolongation of QTC. Now, posaconazole is uh, available as pure and IV, but the oral formulation, the tablet specifically has excellent uh, bioavailability, so much that uh, you know, solution is hardly used anymore. The solution one uh, need, did need to be taken with food, but the tablet doesn't have to be. So the tablet can be taken with or without food, but excellent bioavailability. And the adverse effects are uh, much better tolerated. So this is kind of similar to itraconazole. So it does have GI adverse effects and transaminitis. And similar to itraconazole, it can lead to hypokalemia, hypertension, and peripheral edema through the same mechanism. Now, interestingly, uh, posaconazole might not change the QTC. Now, some sources have cited that it may increase prolonged, uh, increase uh, uh, or prolong QTC uh, 
uh, but you know a lot of sources also mention that there is no change so it really depends on the person but most likely postaconazole does not change QTC and the most uh, the newest azole is uh, isabuconazole or isabuconazonium uh, sulfate uh, which is uh, you know a prodrug but uh, it's uh, available at PO and IV uh, it can be with or without food and it's very well tolerated so you know some GI adverse effects and uh, you know the mechanism for hypokalemia is still there now interestingly isabuconazole can actually shorten QTC so it's actually the opposite of the rest of azoles uh, but um, much much better uh, tolerated now the you know when you go from fluconazole all the way to isabuconazole the price goes up because uh, you know they are, these are the newest agents so fluconazole itraconazole are pretty affordable um, suba itraconazole is very new so this is very expensive uh, voriconazole is uh, uh, somewhat affordable but still kind of expensive but postaconazole and isabuconazole are very very expensive now let's take a look at pharmacokinetics of these agents. So fluconazole is the only azole that's well uh, concentrated in the urine. So anytime there is a urinary fungal infection, fluconazole is the way to go. The rest of them don't get enough concentration. Uh, the same can be said about uh, CSF, except voriconazole also gets good concentration in CSF. So in case somebody has menin uh, meningitis due to uh, fungal species such as cryptococcus uh, or cocci these are the agents that get good concentration in CSF now for drug interactions these azoles categorically involve the CYP enzymes uh, now fluconazole you know somewhat less uh, involved with these uh, so you know you will have less significant interaction with fluconazole but once you get to voriconazole and postaconazole, you get significantly higher, especially with voriconazole because it involves 2C19 and 2C9. You have to be very careful with uh, drug interactions. So anytime voriconazole is involved, make sure you run drug-drug interactions with any other agents that the patient may be taking. Uh, itraconazole also very, uh, you know, uh, a lot of drug interactions with uh, 3A4, CYP3A4. Now the half-lives are pretty much, uh, you know, relatively long for fluconazole, itraconazole, postaconazole, and uh, sabuconazole. Relatively shorter with voriconazole. Now one thing that's interesting is that uh, with voriconazole and itraconazole, they have non-linear pharmacokinetics. The rest of them are linear, and uh, I'll explain what that means in a minute. But uh, when it comes to therapeutic drug monitoring. Because some of these have significant toxicity, uh, it becomes required to do therapeutic drug monitoring, meaning that we would get a level in the patient to make sure the levels are not toxic, as well as to making sure that the levels are also effective. So essentially, fluconazole is so well tolerated and there's not much variability between patients that therapeutic drug monitoring is not indicated for fluconazole. Uh, for itraconazole, there is some variation uh, between patients, so it might be helpful to get levels. In fact, in very high-risk patients, such as transplant patients, uh, you know, it, it's often uh, done in uh, those patients, so the levels are taken. So for efficacy, in general, uh, the level needs to be at least one. Uh, for treatment, and if it's for prophylaxis, slightly lower level is okay, so 0 0.25 to 0.5. Now, uh, itraconazole in general is very well tolerated, so there's really not much toxicity. So there's a very high uh, ceiling for how, how high the level can go before there is toxicity. So uh, one source has suggested that it's, good, it's a good idea to keep the levels under 17 to avoid toxicity. But you know, that's a very large window, so most patients you know, were hardly reach a level of 10 so it's uh, in general very well tolerated now it gets very important to when it when it comes to voriconazole it's very important to do therapeutic drug monitoring because of all those toxicities including ocular toxicity hepatotoxicity and neurotoxicity uh, so for efficacy it's recommended for the levels to be and these are troughs uh, 
uh, to be one, two, three. And then once you go to 4.5, that's when all the adverse effects uh, really become uh, intolerable. So for toxicity purposes, it's recommended to keep the levels below 4.5 to avoid all those um, uh, toxicity. And some sources even say to keep the levels less than 3.5. Uh, so, you know, if you target a level one to three, uh, not only is it effective, but it's going to be pretty safe. And then post uh, it might be helpful in general, uh, you know, if you're using the tablet, uh, the patient's, uh, you know, it's very well absorbed, uh, you know, but if you want to make sure you, you could check the levels and, uh, you know, just like itraconazole, the levels have to be uh, at least one for uh, treatment and 0.5 for prophylaxis and it's not uh, uh, therapeutic drug monitoring not recommended for isabuconazole uh, due to limited data and it's very well tolerated and well absorbed so uh, you know it's usually not needed. The next class of antifungals are echinocandins so these actually bind to the uh, FKS catalytic subunit of the 1,3-beta-D-glucan synthase. So this is an important enzyme. Uh, and by doing that, it inhibits the 1,3-beta-D-glucan synthesis, which is an essential component of the cell wall of uh, many fungal species, uh, with the exception of cryptococcus species. So cryptococcus species do not have or don't have um, you know, significant amount of 1,3-beta-D-glucan. Uh, in fact, cryptococcal species uh, mostly rely on the 1,6-beta-D-glucan, and that's, uh, you know, so these agents will not really inhibit 1,6-beta-D-glucan. So for that reason, this class will not be active against uh, cryptococcus species. Uh, but, you know, for Candida and uh, Aspergillus, which are the most common, uh, they are very good agents. Now, mutations in the hotspots of FKS gene result in resistance to echinocandins in Candida glabrata specifically. And let's look at the pharmacokinetics of these agents. So there are three of these on the market right now, and there is one under development. So caspofungin was the first one. These are all IV, so we don't have any oral formulation in this class. Uh, in general, they are really, really well tolerated. So there's not much adverse effects uh, that would lead to discontinuation. Of note, pretty much none of them get good concentration in the urine, so they're really not good for urinary infections. And they're also not good for uh, any CSF infections. And, you know, in general, they don't really cause any drug-drug interaction. So for that reason, they're also very, uh, you know, uh, friendly. And their half-life uh, in general is, uh, you know, moderate. But the newest agent that's under development has a very, very long half-life. So that one is intended to be you know, like weekly injections, whereas the rest of them are daily, once a day injections. And because they're all IV and, you know, uh, there's not much variation between the patients because they're not really major substrates of SIP enzymes. Uh, so it's therapeutic drug monitoring is not indicated. Now, the next class is uh, flucytosine. So flucytosine uh, actually must first be taken up by uh, fungal cells by the energy-dependent transporter uh, cytosine uh, permease. And then once in the fungal cytoplasm, uh, flucytosine is readily deaminated to a 5-fluorouracil by cytosine uh, deaminase. And then following conversion to fluorouracil, its antifungal effects are mediated through inhibition of both DNA and protein synthesis. So mutations affecting uh, cytosine permeate, cytosine deaminase, and uh, UPRT activity, uh, you know, can lead to um, pretty much resistance to this agent.
and because there are so many targets for mutations leading to resistance this agent should never be used as monotherapy so anytime you see fluocytosine it will be bundled with another antifungal agent for for most fungal infections now lastly we have amphotericin b so amphotericin b uh, works by insertion into the fungal cytoplasmic membrane by binding to ergosterol and forming pores that result in the loss of intracellular potassium, calcium, and magnesium, which can cause cell death. Now, in addition, amphotericin can also induce oxidative stress. So these are all good for killing fungal, uh, fungal cells, but these are also key in a lot of the adverse effects that are associated with amphotericin B. So including, so you know, all of these uh, electrolyte wasting, uh, this can also happen to the kidneys, so a lot of nephrotoxicity from amphotericin B. So the affinity for sterol is uh, kind of similar to affinity of, of uh, amphotericin B for cholesterol. So it can also bind to cholesterol inside the mammalian cell membrane. Uh, so it can pretty much have those effects on, uh, on those cells too, which can lead to not just nephrotoxicity, it happens to be in the heart, it can cause cardiotoxicity, and it can also lead to um, anemia. Now, resistance to amphotericin B can be due to reduction in synthesis of uh, ergosterol, so that way, uh, you know, there's not much binding site for amphotericin B. Now, there are different formulations, so the classic one is the uh, amphotericin B deoxycholate, uh, which is essentially the smallest molecule, uh, which is here on the left, it's less than 25 nanometer. But then, uh, more in order to improve uh, tolerability and reduce all those nephrotoxicity issues, uh, there are lipid formulations. So essentially, these have been, uh, you know, in various forms, been turned into lipid formulation. So we do have liposomal amphotericin B, uh, which is, uh, you know, much larger molecule, so it's less than 100 nanometer. And then we have uh, amphotericin B lipid complex, which is kind of like a chain, and it can be very large. So this is somewhere between uh, 1600 to 11,000 nanometers in size. So let's take a look at the, th uh, the different amphotericin B. So currently there are three that are on the market. There used to be a fourth one on the market, currently not available, but we'll focus on the three that are on the market. So the classic one, the uh, conventional amphotericin B is deoxycholate. And uh, this, uh, so all of them are IV, no oral formulation for amphotericin B. So the conventional causes severe nephrotoxicity, including wasting of potassium magnesium and bicarb so uh, and as well as because this is in the kidneys it can reduce uh, epogen production that can lead to anemia uh, there's also a lot of infusion reactions now because of all this nephrotoxicity uh, it's important to provide saline loading uh, to the patient so in other words uh, patients receive uh, f uh, you know, one liter of normal saline before these, uh, uh, before amphotericin has been uh, initiated in order to reduce nephrotoxicity. Now, in general, they have poor penetration into the urine uh, through IV injection. And uh, therapeutic drug monitoring is not indicated for any amphotericin B formulation. And also, uh, let's talk about flucytosine. So flucytosine is only available PO. It has a very short half-life, uh, half uh, and it is uh, de dependent on renal function. So this is uh, very highly concentrated into the urine. And uh, so, you know, renal function is really important because th this drug can also have severe adverse effects, including myelosuppression, so neutropenia and thrombocytopenia. So renal function must be uh, monitored closely uh, because typically this is given four times a day, uh, but as renal function deteriorates, you know, the dose needs to be adjusted. So because of the serious adverse effects of myelosuppression, therapeutic drug monitoring is indicated. Uh, so for efficacy is the trough that's important. So the trough needs to be at least 25 for efficacy. 
but for the toxicity is the peak that makes a difference so we want the peak to be under 100 once you go over 100 uh, the risk of myelosuppression uh, goes up significantly now lastly let's like a, take a look at the spectrum of activity activity of these agents so it's uh, good to think of yeasts and then molds and then dimorphics so when it comes to yeast uh, these are the significant candida species that cause uh, you know, uh, fungal infections, clinically important. And there's also cryptococcus. Uh, so pretty much amphotericin B has very good activity against most of these, except it doesn't have good activity against Candida lusitaniae, which is, which is historically. Uh, some reports say that it actually might have activity against lusitaniae, but most sources, uh, and especially classically, we say that amphotericin B is inactive against Lusitanie. And most recently, there's been an emergence of Candida aureus, and you know, there may, uh, and these species may or may not be resistant to amphotericin B. So there just needs to be susceptibility testing to find out. Now, for fluconazole, uh, pretty much uh, good activity for Candida albicans, but uh, you know, MICs are much higher for glabrata, uh, so, uh, you know, susceptibility must be checked. And in fact, fluconazole might be, uh, need, uh, might have to be at, given at higher doses, uh, depending on the MIC of glabrata, if it's susceptible dose dependent. And then uh, there is just not activity against uh, crucii. And of course, RS is uh, pretty much resistant to fluconazole. Now, itraconazole uh, is uh, pretty much uh, good activity against albicans, but not active against glabrata, and has somewhat activity against perapsilosis and tropicalis, but susceptibility is needed. Also not active against crucii and um, of course, for uh, Candida auris, you just need susceptibility results. Now, when it comes to voriconazole, this is when you get a uh, broad spectrum. Uh, pretty much voriconazole has good activity across all yeasts, uh, you know, with the exception of auris that may or may not be susceptible. And uh, the same with posaconazole and acevuconazole. So th these three are pretty much broad spectrum antifungal agents. And, um, you know, uh, so when it comes to yeast, they're pretty similar. Now, when you go to echinocandins, echinocandins probably have superior activity against yeast compared to um, azoles. So pretty much more, uh, they cover all of these yeasts, including candida auris. So pretty good activity against candida auris. Uh, but the shortcoming is that Echinocandins are not active against Cryptococcus, so no activity against Cryptococcus. And Fulocytosine is yellow for pretty much most of these because it should not be used alone, so it should be used in combination with another agent, and it's just not active against Crucii. Now next, let's take a look at molds. So then we have different Aspergillus species. And then we have the difficult, uh, you know, molds like Mucoralis and Fusarium. These are, uh, you know, very nasty, resistant uh, molds that cause a lot of mortality. So Amphotericin B has good activity against most Aspergillus, uh, but, you know, then it uh, kind of becomes short when it comes to some of these other molds. Fluconazole has the worst activity, so that's why we would say fluconazole is narrower spectrum antifungal agent. Itraconazole has uh, more activity, uh, but again, it's not active against mucoralis or fusarium. Uh, Voriconazole uh, has somewhat activity against fusarium, but definitely not against uh, mucoralis. And then posaconazole and I said buconazole, that's when they, you get the activity against mucoralis. So when patients have mucoralis, these are essentially the agents that you want to use. And then for echinocandins, they have, uh, you know, somewhat activity against most molds, uh, specifically aspergillus. But in general, uh, their activity is not as good as azole for, uh, for aspergillus. You know, it's the opposite of 
candida. So echinocandins have better activity against candida compared to azoles, but it's reverse for aspergillus. So azoles are better against aspergillus compared to echinocandins. And flucytosin just does not have activity against molds or dimorphics. Uh, the same can be said about echinocandins, no activity against dimorphics. So for dimorphics, we're really stuck with amphotericin B and azoles.